the parts of a computer. Depending on where you're sitting, most of these parts are on a table or desk uh, around you or in front of you. Of course, you're looking at a monitor, which is like a TV screen, and it acts pretty much just like a TV screen, except, of course, it can have, in addition to moving pictures and, uh, and uh, um, uh, still pictures, it can have text uh, as well that you can type and edit. Using this thing, the keyboard, which is like a typewriter, and you'll see that the keys are laid out just like a typewriter, but they have some extra keys and some extra things that we'll be going over. Then there's the mouse. The mouse is a what we call a navigation and selection tool. It allows you to uh, move a little cursor onto different things on the screen, and by pressing a button on the mouse to select them or to make something else happen on the screen. It's called a mouse because it's got a little round body with a long tail connecting it to the computer, although these days sometimes it's wireless so there's no tail. Somewhere nearby, either next to the computer, on the floor under the table, or uh, under the computer on top of the table, is a box. It could be vertical like this, it could be on its side, but it's the computer itself. And it's what uh, does all the work, and it has circuit boards, and fans, and storage media, and ways for other devices to be hooked up to it, and ways for transportable storage media to be uh, put in and out of it, such as CDs and, and memory sticks. Uh, you may have a printer nearby, or it may be across the room, uh, but it's what prints the words and pictures that you type on paper. You might have some speakers, uh, which are just like stereo speakers for uh, voice, music, and other sounds. And somewhere there's a modem, there's a device, it may not be visible to you there, but there's some way to connect to the outside world or to a network of some kind. Uh, these days, mostly it's a connection to the World Wide Web or the Internet. These are all the parts put together. Now, if you, th you can think about the, the monitor, the speaker, and the printer as three different ways to get information out of the computer uh, by watching, reading, listening, and printing. There's only two ways to get uh, immediately, anyway, information into the computer, and that's the keyboard and the mouse. But the computer is what does the work. We'll start with the keyboard and the mouse. Let's take a look at the keyboard. Uh, the keyboard, thankfully, the main part of it anyway, is laid out pretty much as typewriters have been laid out for well over 100 years now, I suppose, with the QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-Y style of keyboard layout, standard typewriter layout. That's the bulk of those keys on that keyboard. But there are a lot of other keys here, and so that's what we're going to talk about right now. Uh, go to the upper left, there's an escape key. That's sort of an emergency, uh, get it, let's get out of here key. It doesn't always work, but most programs are set up so that if, uh, if you're in the middle of something, you decide you change your mind, uh, that you can often press that key and kind of get out or uh, out of the thing you're doing and back to another screen where you might be able to um, figure out what to do next better. There's a row of keys called function keys. We're not going to cover them today, but they're uh, numbered F1 through F12. And if you were using, say, a, a computer at a point of sale in a store, you might assign specific functions to those keys, such as add sales tax or something like that. But uh, it's going to be different for every setup, although they do have functions that are pretty handy. It's just for a later, more uh, advanced course. There'll be some specialized keys near the upper right, such as print screen, scroll lock, pause, uh, we're not going to cover those today either because they're rarely used. Uh, let's get back to this, uh, the main keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, there's a row of, there's numbers along the top, and above those numbers are individual characters like a, a at sign, a number sign, a dollar sign. Um, and just like regular old fashioned typewriters, pressing the shift key, and you'll find shift keys on the lower left and lower right side of the computer or keyboard, um, that those shift keys enable you to make capital letters out of the regular letters of the alphabet, or if there's two commands on a key, uh, pressing shift will allow you to type the upper command. For instance, if you wanted to type a dollar sign, you would press shift and then press the number four at the very top where the dollar sign is. 
Uh, you've got a tab key, which is very much like uh, an indent key on a typewriter, although it has some more functions. You've got a caps lock key, which works just like the, cap the locking of capitals key on a typewriter. Uh, on the right side, you've got an enter key, which is uh, actually has functions very similar to the carriage return handle on a, an old-fashioned typewriter or the carriage return or return button on an electric typewriter. Upper right, you'll see a backspace key, which allows you to backspace and essentially erase the uh, letters you just typed. Uh, but that's, uh, oh, yeah, can't forget the space bar. The large bar in the center near the bottom, uh, at the bottom, is the space bar, and that's for putting spaces between words or characters. There are two other, at least two other keys that I want to tell you about. Uh, you'll look down in the lower left, you'll see a control, CTRL and an alternate ALT key, and you'll usually see them repeated to the, on the right side as well. And those have some special functions that uh, we uh, probably won't get to today, but they, uh, that's about the only, the main difference between that and the standard QWERTY keyboard. Uh, you've also got a, a set of cursor control keys. If you look down, you'll find four arrow keys, up, down, left, and right. Those are used for navigating around the screen, as we'll see. And above that are certain other keys which help you move your cursors or icons around the screen. And most computers have a numerical keyboard, a keypad on the right that looks very much like a calculator or adding machine and acts in pretty much the same way depending on, uh, you can simply type numbers in a document uh, or you can do some other things with those keys as well. Um, the mouse is the other main way you have of telling the computer what to do, uh, and we'll cover the mouse. As we stated earlier, the mouse is a navigation and selection tool. It with the keyboard is one of the two ways that you tell your computer what to do. The mouse is usually connected with a wire to the computer, although these days wireless mice are becoming more and more common. They work the same way. But with a wireless mouse, you just got to make sure you've got it pointed the right direction. When it is pointed the right direction, the side facing the computer or away from you uh, is going to have two buttons, one on the left side, one on the right side. These are usually large spaces, not small buttons, on the mouse. There are more areas than points on the mouse. Many mice in the middle also have something called a scroll wheel, which you can experiment with later. But mostly, the thing you'll do mostly with the mouse is move it around on the table or on a mouse pad and press that button on the left, the left click. You hold the mouse by laying your hand gently over it. The illustration shown here is for a right-handed person. And when a right-handed person lays their hand on the mouse, uh, their index finger falls naturally on this left button area of the mouse. Now, for a left-handed person, uh, it would be, say, the ring finger would fall over the, the left button. But what happens is, when you lay your hand on the mouse, and you move it away from you, toward you, in circles, keeping it straight, that is, keeping the wire side or the button side facing the computer, you can move it around, and it'll move a pointer or cursor on the screen. Uh, that's uh, basically how you use a mouse. Now. As you, uh, you can go ahead now and lay your hand on the mouse and move it around on the screen in front of you. You should be able to see a cursor or a pointer that looks like one of the ones shown on the screen here. Um, but what do you do with a mouse? Well, we're going to find out because next we're going to talk about the desktop. That is the area on the screen that is uh, what you see when you first turn on your computer. The first thing you'll probably notice about the desktop is that the one on the screen in this little presentation doesn't look like the one on your computer. That's because this is customizable. Uh, every computer is going to have a different background picture, different icons placed on the desktop, these little symbols that are around there, program icons usually, or file folders. Uh, there's going to be different icons at the bottom as well but they're all arranged in pretty much the same way. The big, broad, full-screen desktop area 
will contain program icons and file folders and maybe a few other tools. The notification area in the lower right, uh, you won't mess with that much unless you want to say change the volume of sound on your computer. Uh, there's a few other uses that later on you'll get into. In the middle at the bottom, whatever program you have open at the time will be shown there. Near the left side, the quick launch toolbar, that's customizable as well. Uh, every computer is going to look a little different there, and some of them may have very few or no icons in that area. But every Windows computer does have one thing in common on that desktop, and that is the Start button in the lower left. The Start button is, for most people, exactly what it says, where you start. On a Windows Vista computer, that Windows Start button doesn't say Start anymore, unless you roll your cursor over it with the mouse, then a little sign pops up telling you what it is. Uh, but it's uh, the key to getting started with a Windows computer. Uh, after you practice using the mouse and learn how to click, you're going to click on that Start button, and it's going to open up a menu. And it looks pretty complicated, and it is, but this is the, the, the best place to get started when learning how to use a computer. And uh, as, as intimidating as it may seem, this is as simple as they usually make it. Once again, if you click this on your computer, it probably will not look exactly like the one shown on this screen, but it will have all the same things in more or less the same area. The start menu you're looking at right now is a Windows Vista start menu. And the Windows XP computers also have a slightly different layout, but you'll find most of the same sorts of buttons. Let me just give you a quick verbal tour of this, and then we're going to uh, switch from this PowerPoint presentation I've been showing you to uh, some live action. Um, let's, we'll start at the uh, upper left. There's usually, when you get your computer, a few buttons like Internet Explorer and maybe an email button up in the upper left. Uh, there'll be, there may be some other program icons loaded, depending on what computer, what software is on your computer. There'll be, below that, uh, an area that says All Programs. And when you click there, it'll open up a series of files and folders that allow you to navigate to uh, the various programs that are on your computer. Over on the right side, Windows Vista Start menu uh, has some uh, quick links to your files and folders that you'll be building up on your computer as you compose letters or documents and save them, or pictures, or anything else. Um, there's a, a way to get quick access to things you've been working on recently in the Recent Items section. And there are ways to personalize or change computer settings, Control Panel, Default programs are the two links for that in Vista. And there's a place for you to get help and support. The lower right are some buttons to turn your computer off or to restart it. And there down in the bottom is one of the things that Windows Vista uh, is a, uh, is got a real plus in, and that is its search capabilities. You can type words into that box and click the little magnifying glass icon there and you'll be able to uh, find things on your computer that you otherwise might not know where they are. But going back to that all programs, even on a brand new computer, if you click that, you get a very complex uh, list of programs. And you'll probably not know what many of them are. What's a snipping tool? What's a sync center? Uh, well, uh, it is complicated. And that's why I guess you're in a class here to learn how to do this stuff. But uh, to find things, say if you want, there's usually a calculator that comes with your computer, and you'd have to open the folder called Accessories, and in there are all the accessories, including Calculator and WordPad. We're going to look at WordPad in a minute, uh, and Calculator as well, as part of our mouse practice. What you're looking at right now is the desktop to my computer at home. It's customized to my preferences, and it's, uh, of course, not going to look exactly like the desktop to the computer you're looking at now or to the one you may have at home. What I want to do is give you some practice using the mouse uh, because you can't open programs, you can't do anything until you learn how to use that mouse. 
Uh, so what I recommend is that you get someone to help you to open one of the programs that I'm uh, going to show you how to use that are good mouse practice programs just to get you used to using it. Uh, after you know how to use it, then eventually you'll learn how to open these programs yourself. But if you put your hand on the mouse itself, move it around, you'll see that this uh, I'm moving my mouse in just a small circle, keeping it aimed away from me, and I'm moving this arrow that you see on the screen all around. Uh, and that's uh, basically how you move the mouse around. And I'm going to uh, show you that, uh, uh, well, let's take a look at this. I'm going to click on the Start menu and open it up. Because what I'm going to do is get to the calculator that comes with uh, Windows so that you can practice with that. And I've put my mouse on the button that says All Program, and I press that left mouse button. I move it up here to this folder called Accessories, and I'm going to press that left mouse button again, and it opens the folder. And there inside is something that says Calculator. When I press on that icon, it opens a calculator. I move my mouse up to it. I can actually press this left mouse button down on this blue area and move it right to the center of the screen. I know it's not very big, but that's what they give you with Windows computers. So if I want to work this calculator, I put my cursor over the number 2, press that left mouse button just once, and the number 2 appears in the window up there. Then I click on the little plus icon, click that 2 again, and then click on move over here and click on the equal sign. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Just like any calculator. Press clear. Let me do that again. I use a bigger number. I'll click 2, 5, and then let's do some multiplication. This little icon right here. Click the multiplication. 25 times 4 equals 100. So if you can get someone to help you open the calculator, then you can do this as well. You can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and do all the things that you can do on a simple calculator that you might buy uh, in the store. I'm going to open uh, another thing, too. I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to close this program right now, the calculator program. And I do that by rolling over the little X in the upper right-hand corner, and you can see the little pop-up sign said close. I'm going to press that left mouse button again just once, and there it is. Let me come back to my Start menu, press Start, and this time I think I'm going to go to Games, which is another great way to uh, practice using a mouse. Roll my mouse up here. You can see as I roll over things, it turns in blue, but I'm going to go to this one called Games. Again, you may need someone to give you some help in how to find the games and get them open. Once you get them open, they're great ways to practice using a mouse. I'm going to press my left mouse button, click on Games. And it should, in a minute here, gives me a list of games. Now, there is uh, lots of different things in here, but I'm going to pick a game that most people are familiar with. Uh, for instance, uh, Solitaire. It's right down here. And there's an even simpler version of Solitaire called Spider Solitaire, which just, uh, I think it, uh, you'll see in a minute, uh, works more or less the same way, but it's a little different. I clicked on that icon, and what it did was it, you know, showed me a little preview of the icon over here and turn this here blue. Why didn't it open? Well, many programs, when you get into these menus, you actually have to click twice. And you have to click twice fairly quickly. I'm going to double click. That's what it's called. Two clicks of that left mouse button in a fairly rapid succession. It may take you some practice to get used to how fast you have to click it. So I'm going to go click, click, and it opens. That was pretty quick. Click, click. And you can see what's happening here. It's filling the screen with cards. Now, in Spider Solitaire, you can see that they're all the same suit. That's just to make it simpler for us today. But it works pretty much uh, like regular Solitaire, in which you try to arrange things into numerical sequence. Taking a look at what I got here, and I can see a few places where I can make that happen right now. So I'm going to move the mouse on the mouse pad up here and put it on this three card. I'm going to press the left mouse button down and hold it, and then move my mouse, and you can see that I have now grabbed this card. I'm still holding. I'm not releasing. And I'm going to put it here under the 4. Now I'm going to release, and there it is in place. 
you can get the idea here. I'm going to move this queen under the king, click it, hold the click down, the left mouse button, and move the mouse over here into position under the king. Six goes under seven, click under here, and release. There's another six that can go under seven, and our seven can go under this eight. So you can see why this is great practice for learning how to use a mouse, because it is uh, uh, you have to do a lot of clicking and holding. Um, and I won't go any farther with this, but you know you can. Uh, the games are programmed. I'm going to go over here to this stack of cards and click on it, and just like in solitaire, you can uh, draw some fresh cards if you get to a place. But anyway, we're not here to teach you how to play solitaire, uh, but this is a good way to practice using a mouse. Next, uh, we're going to uh, open a program, one that's uh, fairly simple actually, uh, and that will uh, we're going to explain how programs are laid out. Now, I'm going to go back here and click on my start button again, click on that thing and open it up. Again, this looks pretty complicated, but you also saw when I clicked on all programs, it opened up a lot of other windows, so it's even more complicated than it looks at first glance. And, and I know that, and you know that. It's just going to take time and experience working with it. Let me click outside of this box to close it again and get back in without that even more complicated thing showing. Uh, as I, when I click here, uh, you can see that the programs that I use a lot are, I have customized this menu and put them in here to make them give me easy access to them. Uh, what, the one we're going to work with next is called WordPad because it's a very simple word processor and most people want to be able to write on their computer. I'm not going to click here just yet. I could, but I want to point something out not to make your life more complicated, but just let you know that you can even simplify your life further. As you learn these skills, you'll be able to do this. Here's an icon on my desktop. I'm going to click on it once just to drag it up here where we can see it better. I'm clicking and holding putting it up here sort of in the middle where we can see it. It's highlighted right now because I clicked on it. But that is, uh, we'll do the same thing. If I click on this, it will open the program called WordPad. There it is too. If I click there, it will open the same program called WordPad. And I clicked outside that box to close it. And I will let you know that I could also put it down here. I don't think I have it down here right now, but I could have it down here. Why would you do this? As you learn to work with these programs, you'll see that, that the things you work with every day, you want to put them somewhere where it's easier to get at than navigating through files and folders to get at it. But for a program icon that's on your desktop, the way to open that program is to double click. Again, that's a click, click motion. I'm going to go right now, click, click that fast. And it opened a little program. The reason I'm opening this is to show you that this, the way this program is laid out is very similar to many, many other programs you work with. There's a blue bar at the top. When I click and hold in that blue bar, I can actually move this window around the screen by moving my mouse. Uh, now, chances are you want this to be bigger in order to work with it. Um, but let's talk more about this blue bar, and I'll show you what it can do. First, on the left side, uh, it is uh, the name of the file I'm working on. It's just called Document because I haven't named it. That's uh, all it is. The program is WordPad. Coming across here to the right side, you'll see these three icons, which appear in almost every program that you'll work with in Windows. And uh, there's a a button which when, when I roll over it says minimize. It's a little minus sign. I go to the right and roll over that. The little sign comes up and says maximize. And the one on the right says close. That's the one you can click when you're done working with this program. But we're not going to click that one right now. I'm going to click the maximize button to show you what happens. This is a single click. Again, a single left mouse click. And it fills the screen. Uh, now, sometimes uh, when you get uh, more advanced, you'll be you'll have two programs open at once, perhaps. So I'm going to go over here and click the Restore Down button, which I like to call the, the Windowizer. 
and it moves it down into a uh, the uh, box that you see on the screen here. Now you can also resize these boxes. I'm going to come down to the lower right, and as I roll my cursor over this corner, it turns into arrows. I can pull the box bigger, smaller, if you want. All programs pretty much work like this. There are exceptions. Let's go maximize here, fill the screen with our program. Most programs are laid out the same way. There'll be a series of menus, the choices. As I roll over these, you can see that they highlight just a little. If I click a single click on any of these, it brings me some other choices. Now, some computers are set up that you don't, you have to uh, click at the bottom of this sub menu that opens in order to see all of the pro, uh, tools available to you under that. I have mine set up to show them all, all the time. That's the way I like it. And as I roll over these other menus, you can see I've got other choices just by rolling my mouse, not clicking, just rolling over these others. Okay. Let me get out of there and just click anywhere to close it. It's often how you have to close windows. It's just click outside of them anywhere. These icons in the next row are actually some of the same commands and tools that you'll find in the other menus that we just looked at. But you can put them up there if they're buttons you use a lot. Uh, that uh, they, they, they can be made more convenient for you that way. Most word processing programs will have somewhere a place where you can select font. Again, I rolled over that little arrow next to this window and it tells me that that's for font. And when I click that, you can see I've got a bunch of different fonts to choose from, different type styles. And there are many, 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 many type styles. There's another window here. It says font size. This will say how big the font is. And this next window is one that, that you won't need to mess with. Uh, we're using Western type fonts. Up here, or this is a bold button. Uh, you'll see that you can make font bold, you can italicize it, you can underline it, and you can left justify it, center it, right justify it. You can add bullets. So now you, again, can customize which of the icons that are in these, which of the tools uh, that are in these many different choices that you can have appear up in this area. I want to get started typing something. I'm just going to type hello, period. Now, it works just like a regular keyboard. Um, but I'll type uh, hello, my. When I say a regular keyboard, I mean a regular typewriter keyboard. My name is Charlie, period. And uh, if you're not used to typing, it's going to take you a lot longer than that to find the right keys. But I'm going to hit enter, which is just like that carriage return on an old typewriter. Hit it a couple times. And uh, uh, we'll do it again. Uh, I'm pressing the shift key in the letter I, I, and I'm releasing the shift key, N. In, I press the space bar, order to make capital letters, I must press the shift key while I type the letter and press period. Now, what if I want to make a change there? Uh, at this point, I can come over here, move my mouse around. You can see the cursor looks a little different because it wants to show you exactly where you can put it. But I can click right next to that word must, come up and use my backspace key, which is in the upper right hand corner of that keyboard. Press it four times to remove those letters. And I'm going to put C A N. I can press. Now, you can see how you could spend a lot of time just getting used to using this program. And this is not a course in how to use uh, WordPad, uh, it is a course in how to. Uh, get some basic computer skills. So I'm not going to explain much more about WordPad, except that I'm going to show you some a critical skill which you're going to have to acquire uh, once you start working with computers. And that is this idea that you're going to have to save the document. If you create something, you can write something and 
and you can tell your printer to print it. But most people want to save what they do, that is, so that they can come back later and open it up again and maybe uh, revise it a little and print it again. Very common thing to want to be able to do. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Because usually one thing you'll learn is that there are two or three ways to do everything. They've, uh, in order to make it your life simpler, they've made your life more complex. But I'm going to come up here and I'm going to click on File. And it opens up a series of menus. What I want to do is save this document. Now there are times you'll use Save, other times you'll use Save As. But the first time you save something, you can click Save. And it opens up a series of folders. Again, this is something you'll have to get used to. I've custom designed my own folders. Uh, these are put in here by me, depending on what I'm working on. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just, uh, I'm just going to save them right here in this folder called Documents. Sorry, this looks really complicated. But in order to do this, I've got to give it a name. or my, All my documents can't be named Document. So I'm coming down to File, Name. And I'm going to just, it, when it's highlighted, when you start typing over something that's highlighted, it will erase everything that's there. And I'm going to call this Charlie's uh, Letter. Now, uh, once I do that, it will automatically save it as the right kind of document, and it will save it into this folder called Documents. That's where the system defaults to. In older XP computers, it's called My Documents, but it's very similar. I'm going to click Save, and I have now uh, saved the document with the name Charlie's Letter. You can see that in the upper left, it now has the name of the document. But let's say, let's say I add more to my letter. Well, I want to save it. Maybe I want to uh, send this not to Charlie, but to Mary. Hit enter a couple times. Uh, let's make this Mary's letter, period. So I've worked on a document for a while. Uh, I've sent my letter to Charlie, but I want to send a similar letter to Mary. File. Now, if I just click Save, it will overwrite Charlie's letter. That is, it'll erase Charlie's letter and it will replace it with Mary's letter. But I want to save my old Charlie's letter, so I click Save As and it's giving me the path that shows where this letter lives. But I'm just going to change the name slightly. I'm going to change this from Charlie's to Mary's. I don't put an apostrophe in here because there are certain characters that just don't work in file names. And I so I tend to avoid using any characters other than standard letters. Uh, but now I'm going to click Save. Now it says that this is Mary's letter. Later on, if I want to open Charlie's again, I can put a file open. By the way, this is the same thing. If you click File and there's an Open, click out of there. That does the same thing. Click that icon. And there I can see that I've got Mary's letter and Charlie's letter. I'm going to cancel this right now because that's basically all I wanted to show you about this for now is just that this is typical of the way programs work. That is, they're usually arranged in a similar way with similar menus and icons depending on what they're doing. Most of them are going to have these three buttons in the upper right to, uh, uh, to uh, either make them a, a mid-size window, minimize them entirely, or closing them. In fact, I should demonstrate that minimize function. When I roll over that, it says minimize. When I click that, it seems to disappear. It does disappear, but it's still open. And I can see that the letter I've been working on is now shown down here in my taskbar. I click that, it opens back up. And remember, the middle one makes it middle size, where you can move it around and resize it. And the X closes it, which I'm going to do right now. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you today is how to get help when you're working with a computer. That is, how to get access to the help that's built into the computer. 
And for some of you who have never touched a computer before today, uh, you're gonna, it's gonna seem, a, this is all gonna seem a little overwhelming. Um, but like anything else, it just takes time sitting down and doing it, getting over those first hurdles. Uh, and then, uh, you'll find that things begin to come together for you more quickly than you might think. So I'm gonna move my mouse over here, go down to my start menu, click that, and you'll see that one of the choices I have, and again, it may be laid out a little differently, but you're going to find something that says help or help and support. When I roll over that, it highlights it in blue. But when I click on it, just a single click, uh, it gives me some choices. Uh, for instance, I can take a course, if you will, in uh, the basics of Windows, uh, which is very basic computer skills. So when I click on this, just single click, uh, it uh, gives me some choices. I come down here and click on this link, and just a single left click opens this up, and it's going to tell me introduction to computers, what are computers, types of computers, uh, and when I'm done with that, I can use this back arrow to go back to the menu. Um, I can also search on particular topics. Let's say I want to learn more about files. These files and folders things. I'm going to type in this window, F-I-L-E-S, click on the little uh, magnifying glass icon to search, and there it gives me a series of topics uh, working with files and folders. It'll tell you about the different types of files and folders that are on your computer. And there's some of the folders. Uh, by the way, I'm moving down this page by rotating the scroll wheel on my mouse, which we haven't talked about yet. As you can see, there's a lot of information available to you right here. Uh, now, I also want to use this opportunity to show you uh, why you might want to have two windows open at the same time. Uh, you'll notice that uh, on the right side, there's a scroll bar. Uh, that I can use. I can click on this, drag it down, and it will move me through the document. I can click the little arrow and at the top or the arrow at the bottom. I can click in this area here. So you can see there's a uh, lot of a number of ways to do the same thing in Windows. But let me make this a little smaller. Say, and I'm going to move it over to the side. And now I'm going to open. I can see my desktop. There's the icon for WordPad. Let me double click on that to open it. Now what you can do is you can actually set this up so when you're trying to figure something out like how to save, let's say, uh, how to save, I'll just type that to have something in here to save. When I come up here to go file and save, you might go, oh, there's a bunch of folders and files. Well, there it is, right over here, is how to work with files and folders. So you can keep this help open on one side uh, while you're working with the program on the other side. I'm going to cancel this for now. I'm not going to save this. I'm going to click X to close it. And do I want to save it? No, don't save. And we move this back in here.